Hello everyone, this is Planet Mitch from Planet 5D, and today we have a special guest, Dennis Bila, from the last shuttle project. Dennis and people like Trammell Hudson are working on documenting our last space shuttle flights up into space. So welcome, Dennis. Oh, thank you. Good to be here. We're just going to have a casual little conversation where we're going to be all loosey-goosey today. Um, why don't you give us a little quick introduction about the project and what you guys are trying to accomplish? Um, I do work for the Smithsonian, the National Air and Space Museum. I'm a contractor, and uh, about a year ago, they got told they were going to get discovery uh, for the museum. Right. And I was just asking, like, okay, well, you know, what photos are you doing? What video are you doing? And uh, they were like, oh, well, whatever, whatever NASA gives us is what we'll get. Uh oh. So um, uh, there's another museum, the San Diego Air and Space Museum in San Diego. Right. And uh, I do work for them as well. And the director and the president and stuff, they're a really good guy, uh, James uh, Kidrick. And I talked to him about the project. And he said, oh, yeah, he'd be happy to help us out. So he wrote a letter to NASA, and we got approved. And basically, we're documenting the end of the shuttle era. But it's not only like the launches. Everybody focus on the the rocket launch, right? Right. We're moving the shuttle out. We're also interviewing, uh, we interviewed a woman who makes t-shirts to sell uh, throughout the stores in the area. Really? And a few of the bartenders at the different locations, uh, besides interviewing astronauts and even a plumber. We've interviewed a couple of the support staff. So we want to show the whole thing of what it takes to create the shuttle program. Right. It's the most complicated uh, instrument ever made by man so far, with over a million moving parts. It's a it, it is a phenomenal thing, and I and I've been a space geek since I was a wee little kid and stayed up and watched the Apollo shots and all that kind of stuff. So I'm old enough to remember all those. Um, so it's it's fascinating to to think about the space shuttle and and. I mean, the fact that it's been here... Oh, sure, now he decides to call me. Sorry, Barry. Um, you know, the space shuttle program is, what, 25, 30 years old? 30 years old uh, this April. Is it really? Yeah. And there, and, and my understanding is, if this is right, is aren't they using the same computers on the space shuttle to run the machine that they were using back 30 years ago? No, they've updated those Have over they? the course of time. Okay. Yeah, but you're iPhone is still more powerful than some of the equipment on the shuttle. Right. Um, I, I, I was lucky enough, I'm assuming you've been to the Kennedy Space Center several times, right? Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough when I was just graduating from college that uh, I actually had a, an interview um, with a company that was doing some work for um, I've forgotten which program it was at the time, but um, their office was actually on the 38th floor of the Vehicle Assembly Building. And so I got to go in there to do the interview, and it was like, you know, here's this little college geek in his three-piece suit back in those days. And, and it was, I mean, I was most fascinated by just being in that building because it had so much history with the Saturn V and the Apollo and all that kind of stuff, so... I just imagine it's a lot of fun going and, and cruising through all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Plus, uh, you just learn so much, like just the VAB that you're talking about. Yeah. It has mm -hmm. its own weather system. Right. On days, they can actually gen they actually get, like, inside the building rain clouds with a rainstorm. It's amazing. So, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of old technology and a lot of new technology all in the same place. And I, I, I actually was kind of... It was a tough decision because they offered me that position working there, and I was offered a position here in St. Louis to come work for McDonnell Douglas at the time. And I was really torn because I really wanted to work with the space program, but they offered me more money to come here. So um, The other thing that, that always bothered me about that job position was that they were going to be working in a, an off building way out on somewhere on Kennedy Space Center as opposed to being in the vehicle assembly building so 
Anyway, that's my little tiny history about that particular location. But I, I, I've seen Saturn V launches, but I've never actually seen a shuttle launch. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Uh, I've been to a couple, and then obviously I was just to the one uh, last week. Were you there? Yeah. So we're uh, listed as members of the press. We have uh, uh, press credentials. So uh, Tremel was great. He actually modified Magic Lantern to uh, start the cameras because previously it was a bastard system that we borrowed from other people that we had 50-50 shot and I always ended up on the wrong side of that 50-50. Uh -oh. So, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing for the, the launches. Uh, I mean, you have 12 people on this team, is that right? Yeah, we have about nine people at the launch. Some are doing strictly still photography. Right. And then others are doing uh, 3D. We're wrapped up into doing 3D work now. And then um, uh, we have about three core people doing video work. So um, they all have their job assignments. We all pitch together. Just depends at what point. We end up uh, coming in two to three days ahead of time of the launch right and then uh, the day before the launch we have to deploy the equipment so uh, we're fortunate enough that we're assigned our own driver and van and he you know takes you to different locations and it's all about well it's a government thing right so right. how can we do something really cool <laughs> and not spend money <laughs> So uh, our tripods are surveyor tripods. Uh, we use pet stakes to help stake everything down. Uh, the camera housings are being built by the museum, but they're basically right now like glorified top Tupperware cases. Huh. Uh, the equipment has to stay out overnight. Right. You so, so you have to get there the day before. Yeah. Correct. So you set up all the equipment, you set up all the timers, make sure everything is working as best you can, and then, you know, you pray that it doesn't rain that night and that everything <laughs> works in the morning. So, and, and what happens if there's a delay in the countdown? Are you screwed? Uh, yeah, no, they'll take you back out. Uh, there's only a 10-minute window. In fact, the last launch was within two seconds of being postponed. Oh, really? Yeah. See, I remember back in the old days of the Apollo, they those guys would sit there for hours. Yeah, they had a lot more window, but right. since they're working with something in low orbit, they only have a 10-minute window. At, so, And they um, uh, usually work within uh, the mid part of the window, so they really only have like seven or eight minutes to get huh. that sucker off. I see. So on the video side, we have um, Bob Fisher has built a... Uh, is our widget guy. He's a cinematographer and he used to work special effects or work special effects. So he's the guy that finds the equipment to modify. So those are just timers. Right. Since we only have 10 minutes and we found out that with a lot of blue sky we can get 17 minutes uh, video within uh, 4 gigabytes. So we just have that camera kick on right a minute before the launch and just leave it run until it fills up the car. Right. And then on the still side, uh, I don't know, a lot of people don't know that the uh, Cape Candy is actually a uh, wildlife preserve. So they have, and they I forget what they call them, uh, buzzards. Uh, right. So these things, and then there's cranes, and there's right. a bunch of birds. And in a lot of places, the tripods are the tallest things out there, so they'll land on top of your tripod. <laughs> so if you just use, like, a sound trigger, yeah. usually you just get, like, a lot of footage of nothing. <laughs> so you, uh, we normally work our last time, not this last launch, but the time before when we were testing, we had a whole bunch of footage of trucks driving by getting ready for the launch. Mm. So we actually now have timers built into the sound trigger. So the timer kicks the trigger on like a few minutes before the launch. And then uh, the sound of the actual rockets going off will fire the camera. Wow. So well, uh, Don't they also have some sort of audio system where they try to get the birds to fly away? Some sort of loudspeaker thing that goes off You know, first? I think they're pretty smart after 30 years. <laughs> So 
there's a big pop that goes off. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's like some caps that are blown off the engines right. and stuff. Yeah. So I haven't found any birds close by when yeah. that cap goes off. I wouldn't doubt it. Um, so we've kind of, I'm sorry, we, we've kind of sort of missed the whole conversation about what kind of equipment you guys are using. So, um, Well, we're basically uh, all Canon based. Right. So 5Ds for our video. Uh, 7Ds for uh, remotes. Remotes are the cameras being set up on location. Right. Uh, the 5Ds are also on location. And then we're using uh, 1D Mark III's. So uh, the 1D Mark III's uh, at the last launch, we hope to have 36 ringing the uh, launch pad. And then we'll create like an object movie where you'll be able to watch not only it take off, but be able to spin to any side. Oh, that'll be awesome. Yeah. So then the 5Ds, we have two 5Ds at the pad. It's like within 400 feet. Then we have shooting video, and then we have two uh, 7Ds at the same location. Uh, they're all shooting stereo, so they're all paired up. And the intervalometer and the timers, I'm sorry, the uh, clocks and the timers are all set to fire them in pairs so that we can wow. do the stereo alignment afterwards. Right. And then uh, uh, Juke, he's our VR specialist. Uh, he has, I think he cornered the mark on 8mm Nikon fish eyes. They're the old <laughs> heavy F2.8s. Right. He owns three of them. At one time they used to go for eight grand a piece. Good grief. So, uh, uh, he worked on setting a couple up, like, right at the base of the pad so you could look up to the sky and see the shuttle take off. So we have that shooting stills, but uh -huh. a rapid sequence of stills. Right. And then outside of the fence line, we have uh, a camera shooting video and then a bunch of 1D is shooting high-speed stills. Oh, oh, and I'm sorry. And then the team itself, uh, 70s. 5Ds again, and then um, I shoot with a Mark IV, so uh, higher resolution files. And we rented a GH2, Panasonic GH2, to see how we liked it. Uh, might be a good solution for us for some of our uh, remotes. Huh. I'm sorry, I, I realized I messed up part of the recording, so that's okay. We're, that's, why I did, that's why I do two recording things. I'm sitting here going... Wait a minute. That's not recording any audio. Um, so tell us what you're doing for the like the interviews of the the people involved. Um, again, we've been, you know, we're I hate saying this kind of like self-funded. We burned through all our initial uh, funding. Right. So now we're we've started up a Kickstarter page trying to find funding. Uh, We've got some corporate sponsors with equipment like uh, Zacuto is a sponsor. Another one is Bongo Ties. They're these little rubber bands you can tie up cables with. Right. So we're not proud. We're just like, <laughs> yeah, whatever you got, we'll use it, you know, that type of thing. Um, even the triggers, the sound triggers are from a little company in South Carolina who, you know, does high-speed uh, photography. Right. You know, the water droplets capturing that. So we... I ran across them and convinced them to help us out, uh, you know, so we could modify their triggers, uh -huh. you know, that type of thing. So, um, anyway, going back to the, uh, we started out with 5Ds, now we're using 5Ds and 7Ds on location, uh, but we just had a production company and a guy offered to let us use their red, red one. Right. So, I'm hoping that we can work that out because they said, yeah, you can use the camera, but you got to rent the lenses. And after I checked out how much the lens rentals were, I was like, I don't know if I can afford you. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that's a problem. So, yeah. so let's talk about that a little bit in terms of the funding. Obviously, we don't want to discuss any particular numbers here, but you mentioned that, that you've sort of burned through your current budget and now you're, you're doing a Kickstarter project. How, do, how does that work? Um, I mean, I, I kind of know about it, but for the people who may not know, how, do, how does a sure. Kickstarter project work? Uh, Kickstarter is a web 
uh, presence where you can, you go to them and you say, I have a project. I want to film. And they have all different types of right. uh, projects. They do photographers, artists, uh, film and video, uh, manufacturing. You have, their premise is that you have to do something that has a start and a finish. So you can't be like ongoing. Right. You can't raise money to like solve cancer or you know, <laughs> hope for world peace. You have to do something where you can quantify it. Right. You set your, uh, once you get applied and you get approved, um, and it's a very simple process. It's a one page that you fill out on the web saying, I've got this cool idea. Here's what I want to do. Uh, once you get through that approval process, then uh, you need an Amazon.com account. Uh, and you can set that up beforehand or during the process. And now there's a way to take in funding. So if you come to our Kickstarter page, you have to supply people with something. And people all over the map on what they offer. Like we've read one person who is like, if you ever meet them in person, they'll give you a hug. <laughs> so uh, we have it that we'll put a, uh, uh, for a buck, we'll put your name listed on the website as a supporter. Right. And then like at 30 bucks, we'll send you a disc with 3D uh, imagery and video on it. And then at 250 bucks, we do limited edition prints. Wow. So we have a couple of different categories. So uh, you don't get the money from Kickstarter. You set the terms. You want to go 45 days. You want to go 100 days. Right. And then you set your target amount. So we set what we felt is needed for one launch. Um, and then uh, we put down 35 days. So now we're, you know, like shaking the trees, calling up our friends and family and we only get the money if it's fully funded. Right. And you can run over. There's projects that a guy asked for twelve thousand bucks and he got one hundred and fifty thousand in wow. funding. Uh, and then there's a bunch of them that never make it. Right. You know, type of thing. So right. um, if you make it, if your project uh, gets fully funded, they'll keep going until the timeline runs out. And then within fourteen days, you get an electronic transfer to your checking account from Amazon. Cool. Amazon takes a percentage for uh, cost of processing credit cards, right. and Kickstarter takes five percent for you know their administrative fees and sure. stuff like that. Sure. So it's yeah. actually cheaper than a professional fundraiser because I've gotten involved with some professional fundraisers who uh, cost a lot more than a Kickstarter project. So is this your first one? Uh, my first project. First Kickstarter project. Yes, it's my first Kickstarter project. And how's it going? Are we are we doing a fundraiser here? Call in uh, now for yeah, help, Dennis. Yeah, call in now and get yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not. Uh, we're way below our target funding. So yeah, anybody wants to give us a buck, it's real interesting because our Facebook page we've had sixty thousand, sixty-two thousand hits in less than thirty days. And I'm like, you know, if they only gave me a buck each, I'd be fully funded for the last two launches. Right. So, um, you know, it's just tough on our project. What we run into is everybody says, well, isn't NASA doing this? Right, right. You know, they have people who do this all the time. And the problem is that NASA is, it's one place where I can say, well, they're rocket scientists. <laughs> You know, they feel like they were shot by a rocket scientist. You know, it's very fixed. And it's not that they don't do good work, but, right. I mean, still shooting some standard definition. They're limited budget. They don't have HD cameras everywhere. Right. And a red uh, is like, you know, we're happy that they give us 720p, <laughs> let alone a 4K, you know, that type of stuff. Right. So uh, great people. They help us out a lot. Uh, they do a lot of stuff, but they're... They're focused on what they have to do and not in the history of the project. Right. Right. I've seen a lot of those those images that they shoot with you know, to to make sure that the debris isn't falling off the shuttle and all right. that kind of stuff. And so I mean they end up using that for a lot of documentaries and stuff, but it's right. not like I, right. I, I under, imagine it's not the greatest. Yeah. So, so how many more launches do you have to go? Two more. 
there'll be one in April, uh, April 19th, 19th tentatively. Uh, they don't put the official date on until Discovery actually lands, right. which is the 8th of uh, the month. Right. And then uh, the next one will be Atlantis, which is the uh, shuttle orbiter we started with. Um, just the paperwork alone was astronomical. Uh, we were talking to NASA for eight months before I finally got approval. And the uh, people at the museum, the San Diego Air and Space Museum, you know, they were just amazed. They were like, you'll get it just from sheer willpower. You know, we just <laughs> outlasted everybody. So, um, and then there's, uh, NASA has a whole protocol. So, uh, like we've been on top of the RSS, the structure that rolls away from Atlantis. Right. Or, I mean, from the orbiter. So you have to put in a special, they call it. So you've got all this paperwork you fill out so you can go do this. Huh. And then what they give one, they have to offer to everybody so they don't offer anything. Right. You have to research out to know what's available and then go in and ask for it. And I understand, but there was a big learning curve when we started out because we would say, well, we'd like to do this. And I said, oh, yeah, you, you could do that. But they would never say we could do it. <laughs> so we had to learn to say, well, we would like to do that now. You know, <laughs> so... Uh, so it's been interesting dealing with the uh, with NASA and just the whole uh, protocol and having worked for the Smithsonian and other museums, I felt that I was pretty well prepared. But everybody has their own idiosyncrasies on how they do it, right. so it was still a, a learning curve. So and we're known as the very pushy, always putting in request people. <laughs> so I'm, I'm okay with that as long as it gets you what you want, right? That's right. Um, so they also, I'm sorry. They also told me on some of our requests it would take an act of God, and I asked them for his phone number. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's I'm not going there. All right. Um, so how many? What happens to you if you don't get funding for? I mean, you're asking for funding for one launch, but you really have two more to go. So what do you, what's what's your plans? Uh. I don't know, leverage as much as we can, you know, stand on street corners with cups. There you go. You know, sell pencils with little shuttles carved on them. We're going after corporate uh, sponsorship, uh, but corporate sponsorship takes time. Right. You know, nobody sits in behind a desk and says, oh, yeah, this is great. I'll write you a check. It, right. They usually have to go to some other committee, and we've had, uh, we've been fortunate that we got tied up with a, ad agency who's sponsoring us for all the materials so they create the folders and the documents and stuff like that right uh, so in fact I had to tell them to put in there they're donating the services so people didn't think we were blowing money on brochures all over the place <laughs> um, so we're working on corporate sponsorship and then we have had a lot of grassroots stuff like Jeffrey Ross one of the still photographers uh, his father was a NASA, a NASA engineer, worked on the beanie that sits on top of the fuel tank. Right. Um, so he, when he goes, he stays with his family down there, cuts their costs down, all that good stuff. He can borrow dad's car or one of the family cars. Anyway, Jeff's chiropractor was so enamored with our drive that she bought, uh, she paid, sponsored two sets of airline tickets Great. so he could get there and back. Right. And... Um, you know, we've hit up different people for different things. So, uh, you know, yes, it's still as expensive as cost is, but people have been supporting us as well. That's great. Yeah. Well, so what are, I mean, it's, are you competing with anybody else? I mean, it, it, to do well, I have no thing? competition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people who want to do different things. And part of our issue isn't so much the competition it's just trying to make sure we get what we need right so on the funding side I don't think we have anybody in the same waters as us looking for our funding um, NASA is clamping down since it's getting to the last few launches right um, you know that I think they told me that in the first day or first two days that they announced one of the launches like Endeavor they had 20,000 requests good grief you know, so, you know, like 99.9% .9 of those got told, sorry, 
you know, try the next program, you know, that type of thing. Right. And most of those people were like, you know, the Dubuque, you know, some high school in Dubuque whose school thought it'd be cool if two of their students went. Right. You know, that type of thing. So right. they're weeding through and you have to be of a certain value. And I don't mean it in a bad way. It's just that NASA only has so many people right. that manage all this. So they have to limit how many people come in. Right. So pretty much now, if you have a major request, you're not getting in. Right. And that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I just sort of have this vision in my head maybe that uh, you know the last launch all of the major networks wouldn't want to show up and you know I, I guess they get stuck way off off base right um, they have the same probably the same access and they the major networks have already put in their requests and set up the biggest one is some independent production house is doing work for like discovery and stuff <clears throat> but again um, our goal is to show the end of the program right. so we're down there a lot more than right. say you know uh, uh, ABC who is mostly interested in just the news content of the launch right. so uh, Rhonda who is our person on site she goes over to the orbiter processing facility twice a week you know to swap out we have uh, I forgot all about that sorry that's okay. we have <laughs> two sets of cameras doing time-lapse work inside the OPF since last June OPF. Showing, I'm sorry uh, Dennis what is the OPF um, uh, orbiter processing facility okay. it's where the hangars where they refurbish the shuttles right so um, we've had a camera photographing Atlantis since last June Wow. Or two sets of cameras doing stereo of the refit. So it's really interesting to go through all the stills and see, you know, guys just uh, uh, chain swapping out tiles and doing all this work. And then it's that mandatory break. So they're sitting around with their feet hung up on, uh, on the rails and stuff. Right. Um, so we've, we've got, we had to build special boxes to hold the equipment. Uh, we had to, uh, go through a NASA approval process because they're concerned about like, you know, hazardous materials or could something short out and cause a fire. So there was a whole bunch of procedures. So no one else other than NASA itself has cameras in the orbiter processing facility. We're the only ones doing it and we've been doing it since last June. Great. That type of thing. Yeah. Um, so we've got cameras in several other facilities and we're creating some virtual tours of where the astronauts are sequestered before the launch, getting ready for the launch, stuff like that. So it's more than everybody always talks to me about the launch. And the launch is really cool. Don't get me wrong, right. I'm happy to be there. But we're doing so much more that you know I'm concerned about than just the launch. And we're actually going to keep the project going, funding permitting, <laughs> till when the uh, uh, shuttles are delivered. We've asked permission to be involved so we could document when the shuttles get all delivered to their final destinations. So that actually won't be till next year. Right. I, have, I, I, I read something about how people were trying to get access to those. I, I haven't kept up with that. I'm gathering that the locations for all of them have been decided. And Actually, no, they're not making their final determination till April. Discovery, which is flying right now, will go to the Smithsonian. Right. And it's in the federal budget to fund that. So, but the museum obviously is concerned with funding cuts in right. uh, the continuous resolution while well, it happened there. Um, uh, Wright Patterson is, there's 20 some museums that put in requests. Right. Wright Patterson's gotten uh, funding for half of it on the federal budget. But NASA hasn't selected them, you know, to receive a shuttle. Right. So that's kind of like it muddied up the water for some of the other museums saying, you know, what's going on? Nobody's supposed to be selected yet. There's federal budget for <laughs> Wright-Patterson in uh, Dayton, Ohio. Uh, -huh. uh The West Coast, there's two museums, San Diego. The one that we're, our project's being managed under is one of them. And then uh, another museum up in Seattle, Washington is the other one making a request for a shuttle. Those are kind of like the ones that I picture personally are 
in contention. There's right. other museums that haven't even been built yet asking for a shutoff. Uh -huh. so you have to wonder, like, well, yeah, but if you get one, can you afford it? You know, that type of thing. Right. The uh, elementary school in St. Louis asked for one, too, but I don't think they'll be getting it. Well, if they do, let me know. We'll be there. <laughs> um, before I forget, it just dawned on me that we've talked about there's 12 people on your team. Uh, can you rattle off all 12 names uh, <laughs> so they get a little credit here? Oh, sure. No, that'd be great. So John Page, he's the uh, executive producer. Uh, he's the guy that I bust on to make sure that, like, what do you mean we don't have funding and where's the cameras at? <laughs> and then uh, uh, Kathy Brinkworth, she's, we call her the glue because she's the project coordinator. Right. So she keeps track of, like, who flies in where and uh, what time do the events happen and which hotel are we staying at and we're missing a lens cap where can we go so she puts together the playbook we run it like you would a normal movie production with right. a playbook and and uh, trying to story it all out um, let's see my sister is also involved she um, did project management uh, for a fortune 500 company so she came in to come up with all the excel sheets so we can keep track of you know, who's got what and where it's going to. And we need to standardize equipment, which we can talk about later. Um, Jeffrey Ross, he's a still photographer. He's based in Naperville, Illinois. And uh, he's the one that grew up in Coco and watched shuttle launches with his dad. Uh, uh, Ronnie is uh, also down there in Coco. I mean, she lives down there. She comes in. She's our point person with NASA. She's a photographer as well, but she got hooked on video after she started playing with the uh, 7D, and now she's hooked on VR so and 3D, so we've kind of like made her our special. So, and I tell her she's special all the time. <laughs> so uh, she uh, handles, like, if there's no other still photographer, she handles the stills, but she concentrates on 3D and... Um, uh, the virtual reality stuff that we're trying to do as we go forward. Right. Uh, Juke, Juke Lung, uh, uh, he's a VR specialist. He creates all these virtual environments. Uh, that's kind of my specialty, so I worked with uh, Juke before. He's helped me out at the museum. Uh, so he comes down to the launches to do unusual things. And uh, NASA just actually retweeted some of his work. It's been quite interesting. Um, uh, Pat St. Clair, another uh, 3D uh, VR specialist and also does some and also does still work. Um, and then uh, Trammell, he's our, our video guy. Right. And uh, but he's also the programmer. I love Trammell because like the night before a launch, we ran into an issue. He pulls out his laptop and all of a sudden the camera's doing something different in like two minutes. And he's the classic Scotty in the sense of, <laughs> well, I'm not really sure about that. We'll have to see. And then two seconds later, it's done. And I'm like, I don't even pay attention if he tells me there's a problem. I figure if he says it doesn't work, then I can worry about it. <laughs> um, and then uh, Bob Fisher, he's another cinematographer of Hollywood. And uh, he's also does been a lighting grip and a uh, special effects person. And he's really good at... Uh, building widgets so he also works with the San Diego Air and Space Museum because we have so many custom machine parts yeah. for 3D and all these camera housings and stuff so he does the design work and then works with the uh, retired gentlemen there who build us our you know actually machine the widgets right that type of thing right and then we just brought in uh, another person uh, Brendan I can't pronounce Brendan's last name, so sorry, Brendan. I can't pronounce your last name. Um, anyway, Brendan just came on board on the video side to help us uh, also with the uh, uh, shooting video. He has his own red uh, red one, so we were like, oh, yeah, sure, yeah. You're more than welcome to come. And you could leave the camera if you have to leave. <laughs> so uh, that type of thing. And then we have... Um, uh, Aaron, she's the graphic artist, um, 
she's not she doesn't work for us she works for a graphic arts company that helps us out so we do a lot of interfacing with her because she manages the website for us you know that type of thing right and um i count 11 i think 12 well, would be you yeah so 12 is with me <laughs> And then, uh, oh, and we also have some museum personnel that uh, we work with, uh, uh, Jim uh, Kidrick, uh, San Diego Air and Space. He's the president of the museum. He's a great guy. Um, and then uh, Paul Griffith, who's the gallery designer, and Valerie Niels from the Smithsonian. So Valerie Niels is the curator for space history, so she ends up with the space shuttle discovery. And then Paul is working on the galleries for the space display. So we have a lot interface with him. Right. And uh, uh, Vicki Portway, who manages their new meeting and, and websites so as well. Great. I mean, that's, you got quite a crew there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Christmas card time will be, you know, like pretty intense trying to track it all. <laughs> Have you been approached by anybody yet to like buy any of this material after afterwards, or is it is it just purely intended for? No, we haven't really gotten that far. Okay. Uh, I get a lot of people saying we've got a lot of assets that are valuable, right? Uh, but nobody said you know I'll write you a check now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, uh, speaking of assets, I mean you've got to have a boatload of material at this point, right? Oh yeah, we got. Uh, I've got uh, uh, a couple of G Tech drives uh, loaded with content already. So I'm a Mac guy. Yeah. So I have uh, 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 I use uh, Final Cut Pro and then Aperture. Right. And then uh, I've got a couple of G Tech drives for four terabyte drives. They're down to like 300 games. Uh, so I to expand our hard drive or our storage systems. Um, Dennis, would you say that again because the connection really wobbled and I heard virtually none of that in terms of storage. Okay. Oh, um, Final Cut Pro and Aperture is our preferred uh, software with Photoshop. And then we're using um, uh, GTEC uh, RAID drives. And I've got two, four terabyte assemblies and I'm down to like 300 gigs wow and I'm staring at like and uh, the Brendan's tell me yeah and it's 16 gigs for eight minutes and I was like wow boy <laughs> I'll need just a whole dedicated memory system for you just for the red yeah yeah um, how are you managing all that I mean did you, did you I mean, that that could be pretty complicated keeping track of all that stuff. Can you? I mean, can you find if somebody says, "Well, I need this particular thing," do you know where to go find it? Yeah, I do. But the goal is to make it so anybody could find it. Right. So we've come up with our own cataloging system within uh, uh, Aperture and Final Cuts, uh, so that you know the naming conventions and then the. Uh, uh, what you call the metadata we can put in keywords right so everything is filed by dates we keep right. pretty good logs as to when people are working so everything if you said you're looking for an astronaut walkout from the last launch we just need to refer to the dates and everything is at least filed by that right but then we put in keywords like astronauts uh, the event uh, even by colors you know it's amazing how many people have perceptions on colors or sounds that we have put in as much data as we can just so we can keep track of it. Huh. Storage is anybody's nightmare, believe me. Oh, yeah. For storage and cataloging. Right. I mean, it suck up a whole load of time on that. Yeah. yeah I spent, uh, I made a mistake of not jumping on uh, cataloging right away. Right. I had everything stored in mirrored positions, but. I didn't, I, it went like six weeks before I said, oh, I really should catalog stuff and come up with naming conventions. And it took me like another six weeks just to catalog it all. I bet. So now it at least is easier because we have a published system that each photographer and videographer is supposed to follow. And I say that supposedly follow. 
Um, Let's it's not amazing. name names. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's amazing how many. Uh, we use a lot of those little portable hard drives, you know, yeah. iOmega and verbatim. So they'll be loading them up and then send mailing them to me uh, uh, to grab all that stuff. So for the next launch, we're adding we're adding a person to be our media handler, just so we can keep more control over it. Yeah, I can uh, imagine. Yeah, and you know, you got five or six people going on, and like, uh, I'm worried about this past launch. Yeah, I know that I've some people have some things from last year that they forgot to give me, and now we're trying to, you know, make sure it all gets together. This is a sort of a, I guess, a personal question because I use Aperture too. Do you keep all that stuff in one library, or do you mix? Do you make a library for every launch? Um, no, I keep it in one master library, but I I set up a uh, in Final Cut like a bin, right? I keep a project right uh, for each launch. Okay. So each launch is categorized uh, by the launch, and then we have a master of. Uh, like fun shots, you know, all the fun shots go here. All yeah. the uh, all shots with uh, pre-launch will go into this folder because there won't be as many or this project bin that right. type of thing. Right. So right now the issue in dealing with like museums, like the Smithsonian, we have a presentation to them March twenty fourth, where we'll uh, I won't be able to make it, but some of our team will go there and show them the images that we've done and then there'll be a discussion of what they're maybe looking for in addition for their galleries and what of ours they can use um, just interfacing with the museums because what do you think the most important thing is to the museum if you could guess what is the most important image what would it be uh, some kind of a launch image no any other guesses astronauts no I'm failing. <laughs> the signs. They're interested in a lot of pictures of the signs on the grounds for the day of the launch. All the caution signs. Really? All the yeah, because <laughs> they want to get they want to show the atmosphere and all the different stuff. Huh. You know, so there's a ton of signs that go up during the launch on like, you know, caution blast areas. Right. And, you know, uh, do not enter and stuff like that. That was a big thing for them. It's like yeah, could you make sure you shoot all those signs? Because NASA doesn't shoot those signs. Well, nobody yeah. thinks of shooting those signs, I, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so I probably have a gigabyte of signs. <laughs> and then artwork. Um, the astronauts' kids make little drawings, you know, like refrigerator drawings and stuff. Yeah. They're all posted at NASA, every one of them. Really? So uh, the museum is interested in a copy of each one. And you wouldn't believe how many specials it takes to get access to all those drawings. Wow. So uh, so those are things that none of the other projects are diving into, right? right. You know, they're right. all, you know, it's the launch, it's the astronauts suiting up. Right. It's, you know, that type of thing. And we're trying to, you know, we're busy photographing and filming the guy who, like, makes sure the gravel is the right height for the crawler to roll over when they bring the shovel up. Right. You know, that yeah, and 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 that's really what makes the story, doesn't it? The people. Yeah. Um, because I I remember there was a movie not too long ago, and I, I'm not going to be able to come up with the name of it that um, documented a, a sort of a recreation of the guys that were down in Australia at the satellite dish during the Apollo 11 lunar landing. Mm hmm Um, and what they were doing. I mean, it's these guys sitting around in this building waiting for the signal from the moon to come down. I mean, it, it you know, it, it made an, an hour and a half long movie that was fascinating. I mean, it, yeah. obviously they trumped it up a little bit, but, you know, those are the kind of things that, that people really like to see. And none of that was documented at the time. So I'm, I'm really thrilled that you guys are doing stuff like that. That's, yeah, it's very the, worthwhile. Yeah. The, uh, our escorts were escorted everywhere, and most of the escorts uh, during launch activities are volunteers. Ours is Roy. Roy is a great guy. Yeah. He started yeah. during the Apollo program, working on capsules and stuff. So he's a wealth of information, and he loves to talk. So you can just sit there. In fact, Trello was just like in awe of this. You know, Roy as he's rolling through one story after the next, 
and he basically started to Apollo, and if somebody will listen, he'll take you all the way up to, <laughs> you know, shuttle 133, you know, right. that type. Right. So, um, and then there's, like, cute stories that we're trying to document, too, like, there was some circus or something in the area, and they had a bunch of armadillos, and they escaped. I'm oh. not sure how you have an escapee <laughs> armadillo, but they're, they run all over now. Kennedy, they've been breeding like crazy. Wow. So uh, uh, you go around, and you're like, looking. there's this armadillo crossing the street, and you're like, how the hell did it get here? And they've got this whole population of them now. Wow. So... Um, uh, you know, just the story of listening to guys tell you about, you know, these armadillos showing up one day and what they had to do. Right. Fascinating stuff. Um, is there anything else? I mean, we've been at it almost an hour, so I don't want to keep you forever. Um, yeah, no problem. <laughs> is there, there anything else that uh, you particularly want to tell the people about to... Uh, urge them to donate to your uh, to your. Kickstarter well, you can project. check out our yeah. You can check out our website, uh, thelastshuttle.com, and uh, on the front page is our Kickstarter video and a link back to Kickstarter. So we're trying to raise twelve grand now for the next launch. Uh, if that's successful, then hopefully we'll do another funding drive to cover you know, the very last launch and go from there. Right. Or uh, we're also looking for equipment and stuff, so they can always contact us uh, by email. Uh, mine is Dennis at LastShuttle.com. So, um, it's it, not, or, I'm sorry, it's not the Last Shuttle, it's just Last Shuttle? Oh, no, the LastShuttle.com. Right. right, okay. Uh, and then um, uh, we're also um, uh, speaking so we're at a couple of events coming up talking about the shuttle program really? and stuff like that. Yeah, we're at some science fiction writers group here in uh, Illinois. We're going to be at a museum composium in a couple months talking about the project and what's required to, right. to do it to the museums. And we're trying to get into Comic-Con, but we're not sure who to reach out to for that. But I thought that'd be a blast to go there. Well, I actually have a connection there, so maybe I can help you out. All right. So there. So there. All right. Well, let's wrap it up. I mean, I, you know, I probably could ask you a bazillion more questions between now and the moon rising. Um, really appreciate your time, Dennis. Um, and I think you've given us all the websites on the way out. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Sounds like an echo. Let's do that again. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. All right, Dennis, thank you so much.